It wasn't that long ago that you saw this train, and I mean that statement literally and figuratively. It's the train 37T, or at least it was. It was abolished back in 2020. What I didn't tell you about this train was that it stalled about two miles up the line. What a surprise. But to be fair to NS, it wasn't caused by human error this time around, but instead mechanical error. The third unit, the Dash 944 CW number 9610, malfunctioned upgrade and brought the train to a complete stop. In response, the K79 local switcher had to take their power, tack onto the rear of the 37, and nurse the disabled train to Clark Summit. Hello rail fans, before we get too deep into this video, I wanted to point something out. I just mentioned that the third unit on the 37T conked out causing the train to stall. That engine was locomotive number 9610. But did you notice that the third unit in the helper set was locomotive number 9510? I'm pointing this out because in my first time capsule video that I posted a few days ago, the NS Train 30T had the 9710 fourth out. I just find that a neat little parallel that occasionally happens in railroading. And as long as I have your attention, let me tell you about these time capsule videos. The purpose behind them is to be something of an ancillary video to my main videos that I post in the evenings. Since I can't include every single train that I've shot in my main videos, and believe me when I say that I've shot thousands of trains, and also since I can't always show you the entire train in my primary videos, I'm adding these alternate time capsule videos so that you can follow along with me and see everything that I saw exactly as I saw it. These time capsule videos are uploaded in the order that they were shot, and they don't have any voiceovers, graphics, or fancy editing. They're meant to show you, the interested viewer, what ran through northeastern Pennsylvania at a particular time and how much things can change over time. And unlike in many of my primary videos, I can actually show you the entire train as I mentioned before. Usually it'll be uncut so you can see the power and the rolling stock, much of which is gone today. And an added benefit is that by seeing the entire train, you'll learn to identify the trains just by looking at their makeup. I'll be uploading these time capsule videos every day that I can at 6 a.m. Eastern Time. I'll also be including any relevant information about the train in the pinned comment. So if you're up and about in the AM, make sure that you check out my time capsule videos or watch them later in the day or whenever. Now, back to the video that you actually came here to watch. One year ago, almost to the day, a ridiculously long Train 11Z elbowed its way down the line with a little too much power up front and not enough in the middle. What I didn't show you that day was the aftermath of such a train. About 14 miles down the line in Yatesville, the train went into emergency and had the entire railroad and the town roads blocked for hours.
How does that old saying go? Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. We've seen a lot of that old adage here on this channel. Today, another Train 11Z, more than 18,000 tons and more than two miles long, suffered the same fate as you watch this multi-mile long giant lumber past. Pay close attention to the radio chatter. I've said it in other videos. Welcome to the new normal of Class 1 mainline railroading. How long can a train be? I have trains now running up the Willamette Valley that are 15,000 feet long, going through city centers. Uh, how long are we going to allow people to block emergency vehicles? Uh, there's, these are mostly at-grade crossings. I mean, is there any limit to how long they can make these trains?
In railroading vernacular, the acronym DP stands for Distributed Power, or sometimes called Distributed Power Units, or DPUs. Distributed power are locomotives that are placed at the rear of a train or at midpoints of a train or a boat. DPUs are typically used for super long trains, usually exceeding 10,000 feet, to prevent derailing and or exceeding the draw gear strength. Other benefits of DPUs are minimizing run in and run out of coupler slack throughout the train, as well as reduced draft forces along a train which in turn reduces the lateral force between the wheel and rail on curves, thereby reducing fuel consumption and wear on various running gear components. Faster braking is another benefit of DPUs. When all of the brakes are at the front of a conventional train, it can take several seconds for pressure changes to spread to the rear. Under distributed power operation, the brakes are set at remote locomotives simultaneously with the command initiated on the lead locomotive, providing more uniform braking throughout the train. DPUs should not be confused with helper locomotives, which are added to help move heavy tonnage, usually over grades and therein lies the difference between the two. Distributed power locomotives, or DPUs, is the actual head-end power needed to get the train's tonnage from point A to point B, albeit spread out through different parts of the train. Helper locomotives are extra locomotives that are needed to get the train and its head-end power, which sometimes includes the DPUs, over a specific portion of the railroad, usually an upgrade. In many ways, my fondest memories of CP's SD40s were not on the head ends of trains, but rather when they were tacked onto the rear of them, specifically the NS coal trains, like the 5905 shown here in 2004, easing off of the Luzerne Susquehanna branch and tacking onto a northbound to push up and over the Clark Summit. Unknown to many, these units didn't cut off once over the summit, but assisted these trains to and past Binghamton and over what is now the Norfolk Southern Freight Line between Bingo Town and Albany. The Belden Hill grade and tunnel being the last obstacle these heavy northbound drags had to tackle. On another day, in an earlier year, another pair of 40s idle on the Buttonwood siding as they wait on a coal train to push northbound. After the closing of the former Southern Railway's saluted grade in North Carolina, the maximum grade that's seen on U.S. railroad main lines today is about 2.2%, which, back in the steam days, would increase the locomotive's effort by a whopping 800 80 percent. With that as a comparison, as small as a 0.1 percent grade may seem, in those same steam engine days, it could increase the amount of locomotive power needed to go uphill by as much as 40 percent compared to that of level track. Here in northeastern Pennsylvania, on the 10-mile climb from Taylor to Clark Summit on the Norfolk Southern Sunbury Line, the ruling grade is said to be 1.54 percent. Once negotiating the grade at Clark Summit, the ruling grade of the Pennsylvania cutoff is 0.55% and, once again, back in the steam days, increased the locomotive power required by a whopping 220%. And now, with all of that locomotive technical knowledge as background, you can see what today's modern locomotives have to deal with. Helper operations in northeastern Pennsylvania go back for as long as trains have been moving coal and merchandise out of the area. There are three lines that have to climb their way out of the region. The Sunbury Line north to Clark Summit, the former Lehigh Valley Mountain Cutoff south to Penobscot, and the former Erie Lackawanna, nay Lackawanna, main line southeast through the Poconos. On mile post 692, a.k.a. Buttonwood Yard on the Sunbury Line, the DMS siding, in addition to unloading salt and loading scrap metal, was used as a helper pocket in the 2000s when NS coal trains to Johnson City, New York and Bow, New Hampshire were a common sight on the line. 
Helper power usually consisted of two Canadian Pacific SD-40s of various types as shown here in 2003. This siding was also used for locals to duck out of the way of mainline trains as was the case on another day when I caught some DNH and CP power sitting in the siding. Today, the siding no longer sees any rail service but is used to park maintenance of way machines and railroad owned vehicles as shown by the new fence and the rocky road to the left. And trains, when they need <coughs> a push to get over the line, have to struggle their way to Taylor if they make it that far at all, where the locals K81, K82, or K79's power will tack onto the rear and shove them up to Clark Summit.